Today's passage is from the book, that's from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Micah 6, 1 through 8. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountain, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Bala, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, son of Borah, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Galag, uh, Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come with him, for him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Around the turn of the century, there was a television show on called That 70s Show. It was a show about a group of teenagers coming of age in the late 1970s. And this was a long-running show, but there was one scene from this show that stands out as my favorite scene in the entire series. One of the characters, a girl named Jackie, had to become roommates with one of the other characters on the show. Now, if you've ever seen this show, you would know that Jackie would not be easy to live with. She was high maintenance. She was selfish, egotistical, and seemed to enjoy putting other people down. And after an entire episode of her being just a terrible roommate, the girl she was living with had some financial problems, and Jackie showed up with a lot of money to help her out. And the girl said, Jackie, that was really nice. Why did you do it? And Jackie said, well, I was reading your diary, how I can be kind of tough to live with. <laughs> and so I wanted to do something nice. And another character said, Jackie, this is really nice, but, you know, most of the time when someone wants to be seen as nice, they try to be nice on a daily basis. And Jackie said, yeah, I thought it'd be easier to write a check. Sometimes that's the attitude people have with God. They want to be right with God, but they think it'd be a lot easier if I could just write a check. That was a problem that the people of Israel were facing in Micah's day. So today we return to the book of Micah, and today will be our last day in Micah. We are jumping over chapter 5 because any way I cut it, that is a Christmas passage. So we'll return to Micah for a week in December. But today's passage is the climax of Micah. Everything that Micah has been building towards up to this point leads to this one passage. Micah returns to his complaint against Israel. He says that, the people have abandoned the Lord, turned away from God. And this is something he said several times over now. And God said to the people, what have I done to you? Have I laid any kind of heavy burden on you? And God said, no, the, the reverse is true. God brought the people out of, e of Egypt, out of slavery. He made them into a new nation, into a people. He gave them the promised land. He gave them leaders like Moses and Aaron and Miriam to watch over them. And when others wanted to curse him, them, God blessed them. And yet still, the people had turned away from the Lord. They chased after false gods. They had become corrupt and uncompassionate. Yet just in case anyone was still listening, Micah wanted to tell the people how to set this right. How to have a right relationship with the living God. But 
before he could do that, first Micah had to correct some false ideas that the Israelites had. Seems the Israelites wanted a quick fix. Doesn't that sound like America today? We're always after the quick fix. We want the fast solution. Any problem that you can't solve in a half hour just isn't worth dealing with. That's where the Israelites were. They wanted the quick fix. They wanted to be able to just do some big, grand gesture and you'll be done with it. Get back to living how they wanted to live. They wanted a quick fix with God. Micah said that doesn't work. With God, it's really with everything important in life. There isn't a quick fix. There's not a real shortcut. The Israelites wanted a quick fix. And they, so they said, what can I do? What can I bring to God that will just solve all this right now? Can I bring the one-year-old fatted calf? That would be the most valuable, the best of the herd. The Israelites said, well, that's not enough. Okay, I'll bring a thousand rams, 10,000 rivers of oil. If I could just fix this right now. That would have been a big offering. In ancient Israel, one of the things that people offered to God was olive oil. And normally, an offering of olive oil was measured out in one-tenth of a liter. The Israelites offered to bring 10,000 rivers of oil. If only they could have this quick fix. And that is a huge offering. They even offered to bring their firstborn child as an atonement for their sin. The nations around Israel did still practice child sacrifice, and God had forbidden that evil practice. But at least symbolically, the people were saying they were willing to give up whatever was most valuable to them, if they could just fix this now. They were willing to give up everything, anything God wanted to just get this quick fix. I think sometimes today in America we fall into that same way of thinking. We want the quick fix. We think if I can just do something fast, if I can bring just a big enough offering, then I can set everything right with God and you know, get back to living how I want. Sometimes they think they want to literally bribe God. They'll say if I can get just a big enough offering to the church, then God has to accept it. If that won't work, they say maybe I can flatter God. You know, I'll spend a few days just really praying and singing songs and praising God, and, and that'll take care of it. And then I can get back to living how I want to live. Micah rejected that attitude. He said we can't buy God's love. We can't flatter our way into a right relationship with God. People in Micah's day brought offerings to the Lord. Oil and rams and birds and Ghosts, so and they thought they could buy God's love. And today, sometimes people will try to buy God's love with money or flatter God with enough praises and songs to get God to do what they want. But Micah rejected that thinking. He said there's no way to bring a single offering that's going to set everything right. Probably my, ba my favorite description of this comes from the 50th Psalm. Psalm 50, uh, verse 12. And people were bringing offerings to God. They were bringing rams and goats and birds and oil. And they thought this meant that God owed them something. They thought that if they brought all these things that God needed, then that meant that God was in their debt. In response to that, God said, If I needed food, I wouldn't ask you. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you about it. God doesn't need food. But even if he did, he wouldn't go to them. The Lord is the one who made those 10,000 rivers of oil the Israelites were offering to him. He doesn't need their offering. Still, today, God might say to us, if I needed praise, I wouldn't tell you. God doesn't need praise. He's fine without it. But even if God did need to be praised, he wouldn't come to us for it. <clears throat> I remember this many years ago, a long time ago, I was playing basketball 
with my cousin. At the time, he was about eight years old. And I was trying to show off a little bit. Not, not, not very good. But I was doing a few trick shots, and my eight-year-old cousin said, Wow, Brian, you're really good at basketball. Okay, that's, that's nice as far as it goes. Now imagine I ran with that. Imagine I took that and I went to the NBA and I said, Hey, my eight-year-old cousin says I am really good at basketball. I want a 20 million contract now. I imagine they would laugh at me for a very long time before throwing me out. God does, but God doesn't need our praise in the same way that my eight-year-old saying I'm good at basketball is fine, but it only goes so far. Or imagine if my dog, which I don't have, it's hard to talk, which would freak me out. And my dog said, Brian, you're really smart. Okay, why would I care what a literal dog thinks of my intelligence? There are some people I know who give me that compliment, and it really wouldn't matter that much. Or take a goldfish. I don't know how they figured this out, but scientists say that a goldfish has an attention span of two seconds. Imagine a goldfish could say to me, Brian, you, can, you have a really good attention span. You can really focus. Why would that matter? I know it might not always seem like it, but I actually can pay attention to one thing for more than two seconds at a time. A goldfish telling me what a good attention span I have isn't going to be important. In a similar way, our God is the God of the universe. He is the creator of everything that is. If he needed to be praised, he wouldn't come to us. He is the author and sustainer of life, the source of all good things. Of course, he is greater than we are. And having frail, self-centered creatures like us tell him that isn't going to make a difference. He doesn't need our praise, just like he didn't need the offerings the Israelites were bringing to him. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that we should stop praising God. Just like Micah was not saying that the Israelites should stop making offerings to the Lord. We should praise the Lord. He is the God of the universe, the source of life. If we are not praising him, then it's clear we don't understand who he is. And beyond that, praise is good for us. It is for our benefit to praise the Lord. Just like the Israelites should bring those offerings to God. And that those offerings were for their benefit. Micah was not telling them to stop doing that. What I am saying is that we should not praise God in order to flatter him, to get him on our side. We should not think that our praise will somehow get God to do what we want or set a right relationship with God on his own, as if we could just kneel down and pray really hard and then live the rest of our lives any way we want. Michael was rejecting that kind of thinking, to say that if I can just give enough money, bring a big enough offering, pray hard enough, then that will square me with God. And everything else doesn't matter. Like I said, that does not lead to a right relationship with God. And so, how do we have a right relationship with God? What is it God requires of us? If we can't give enough money to buy God's love, if we can't flatter our way into a relationship with God, how can we have a good relationship with the Lord? Micah told us that it's not complicated. I think sometimes people try to make life more complicated than it really is. I don't know why life is complicated enough as it is. But Micah says that God has told us how to have a right relationship with him. Micah said, he has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. And notice that Micah put this in the past tense. Micah did not say he will show you what is good. Micah did not say, I'm about to tell you what the Lord requires of you. Micah said, he has already shown you. God has said this over and over again throughout the Bible, how to have a right relationship with him. There's no big secret here. There's no hidden knowledge, no great surprise, no hidden message that we need to comb the pages of the scripture to try to decipher. God has told us again and again 
how to have a right relationship with him. And Micah sums it up in today's passage. Micah said, what, is, what does the Lord require of you? Three things. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Those are the things that God desires of us. And so I want to look at each of these three things individually. Because this is how we have a right relationship with the Lord. First, Micah said, act justly. Do what is right. Have integrity in your relationship with other people. Live out the fruit of the Spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. Practice peace. Treat people gently and kindly. Be examples of patience and trustworthiness. Do not be consumed by the negativity of this world, but seek the joy of the Lord. Be good and self-controlled. Probably the most significant thing I can say about this today is that Micah tells us to act justly, no matter what anybody else does. If you have kids, or if you work with kids, or if you've ever been around a child at any point in your life, then you know that kids tend to get into trouble. Part of being a kid. And when a child gets in trouble, almost all the time, the first thing he's going to say is, he started it. Or, well, she did this first. I think as adults, we can still fall into that trap. When we have failed to act justly, we say, well, what about what that person did? But, of course, God doesn't ask us what that person did. God did not say act justly as long as people deserve to be treated justly. He did not say act justly unless someone else breaks the rules first. God says that we should act justly, no matter what anybody else does. God calls us to act justly. Second, Micah says that we should love mercy. You've heard me talk about mercy many times, even in the last few weeks. And to have a right relationship with God, we need to love mercy. Mercy means that we do not receive the bad thing that we deserve. It is forgiveness in action. Forgiveness is an internal thing. I forgive a person in my heart. Forgiveness is choosing to love someone despite the bad thing or the series of bad things that that person has done. Mercy is putting that forgiveness into action. Once I've chosen to love a person despite their actions, mercy means that I then do not deliver the negative consequence a person might otherwise deserve. And I have talked about mercy a lot, even in the last couple of weeks. So what I really want to focus on today is that Micah tells us to love mercy. Not just be merciful, not just show mercy. Love mercy. Seek out opportunities to be merciful. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And we are all in desperate need of mercy. So if we want to have a right relationship with God, then we need to love mercy, to seek out opportunities for mercy. If I just want to receive mercy for myself, then I don't really love mercy. I just love myself. If I love mercy, then I both want to receive mercy and I want to give mercy to other people. Micah calls us to love mercy. Then there's a third thing that Micah says God requires of us to have a right relationship with him. But this one can be a little tricky because the wording throws people off sometimes. Micah says if we want to have a right relationship with God, we should act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. But I think sometimes people will hear that and they'll say, ah, I see three Christianese type of words. There's justly, and mercy, and humbly. So those are the things God wants. Justice, mercy, and humility. 
This is such a common misconception that I have seen many, many examples of people cutting that verse off before they get to the end of it. I've seen many examples of people quoting this verse as saying, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. That's not right. That's not what Micah is saying in this passage. He said, that first, we should act justly. And second, we, can, we should love mercy. And third, we should walk with God. It's not the humility that Micah was focusing on, but the walk with God. God wants us to know him. He wants us to talk to him in prayer. He wants us to hear from him in the Bible. He wants us to sing his praise. He wants us to meditate on his truth. He wants us to know him as God. And the way he described this is like two friends walking down the road together. Now, if we are going to walk with God, then of course we need to do that humbly. He is the Lord of the universe. The only way we can walk with him is in humility. But for Micah, the focus is less on humbly and much more on the fact that we are walking with God. So, this is what is good. This is what the Lord requires of us. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And it's important to know that this is not a pick and choose kind of situation. This is not a time when two out of three ain't bad will work. Micah calls us to all of these. He did not say act justly or love mercy or walk humbly with your God. It's not multiple choice. He calls us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. I think people sometimes will focus on just one of these. There are those who will say you should just act justly. You do what is right. As long as you are doing what is right, then God's going to be good with whatever else. There are others who say it's all about mercy. You forgive others. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. And it doesn't really matter how you live beyond the fact that you have mercy. And of course, there are those who say all that matters is walking with God. Just have a relationship with the Lord. He doesn't really care about the rest of your life. Just make sure you're praying and talking to God and everything else will be fine. But that's not what Micah tells us the Lord requires of us. He calls us to all of this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. When we started the book of Micah a few weeks ago, I said that Micah contains my second favorite verse of the Bible. This is it. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. That you act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I think that is the greatest description of a right relationship with the Lord that has ever been recorded. That said, it is my second favorite verse of the Bible. Personally, my favorite verse of the Bible comes from the book of Romans. It's Romans 5, 8, which says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I want to close today's sermon by talking about that for just a moment. Because acting justly and loving mercy and walking with God is important. That is how we have a right relationship with the Lord. However, Romans 5.8 also reminds us that we haven't always done that. None of us have walked with God all of the time. None of us have shown mercy every chance we get. And all of us have had many, many instances where we failed to act justly. But Romans 5.8 reminds us that God knew that was coming. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came to earth as a man. He lived a sinless life and he died on the cross for our sins. On the third day he rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And we put our faith in him. We have forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. The Lord has told us what is good and what he desires of us. And now... He reminds us that we're not always going to live that way. But when we fall down, when we fail in justice or mercy or in walking with God, we have a Redeemer. Christ has died for us. He has taken away our sin. And he has 
given us new life. And so now that we have been redeemed, let us act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. In a moment, we're going to stand for an invitation hymn. And as we stand to sing, if that's not been your life, if you're not acting justly or loving mercy or walking with your God and you want that, you want to move to a right relationship with him, if you're try, tired of trying to flatter your way into God, if you're trying, tired of trying to buy your way into God's good graces, if you want a right relationship with him, you have an opportunity. I ask you'll stand with me for an invitation hymn. Oh, wait, uh-oh. I think I left the invitation hymn off. What number is it, Rita? You said 339, but I don't know if the number. 1, 2, 3, 38. You're going to have to get your books out. <laughs>